high desert lands of the American Southwest, a modern-day ritual pitting man against nature is being played out in some of the world's most spectacular terrain. But these weekend warriors who come to the desert in the hundreds have a not-so-secret weapon at their disposal. Squat, ungainly looking, and possessing the tenacity of a bulldog, this is one U.S. born and bred vehicle that won't win any beauty contests. But the allure of the legendary Jeep goes well beyond mere appearances. You name it, the old Jeep has done it. It was sort of the willing horse. Anything you gave it to do, it did it in spades. I guess you'd have to take one out and drive it <clears throat> because this thing is like a billy goat. You can climb mountains with it. There was a day when there was no Jeep or anything even like it. Before the Second World War, the American military relies on a hodgepodge of vehicles to do the dirty work of finding the enemy. But warfare is about to undergo a radical transformation. New challenges call for new solutions, and the Jeep is going to lead the way. It will go anywhere carry a fairly impressive load. It can be used to communicate, it can be used to deliver, it can be used to fight. It can be used for any job you wish a cross-country vehicle to do. The story of the modest Jeep begins hidden behind the clash of historic forces, but the tire print it leaves in its trail is as deep as it is wide. And while it may be the ugly duckling of the American automotive industry, its impact is felt around the globe. Jeep is a, is a word, you, you, can, you can go into the wilds of Africa and say Jeep and people will know what you're saying. I mean, it's the one thing about America that everybody can agree that they like. Uh, you know, I, I fully expect someday to see a sign that says, Yankee, go home, but leave your Jeeps. 60 years later, the Jeep's legacy is stronger than ever. But instead of a way of getting to the front lines, today's Jeep is about getting away from it all. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's what's called a Jeep thing. Once you get hooked on a Jeep, it uh, seems like you're a Jeep lover forever. Born out of necessity, the little Jeep, that most American of motorized creatures, has launched an industry, a way of life, and a mythology all its own. At the dawn of the modern era, even the major military powers are living with old technology. World War I may be called the war to end all wars, but there's a seemingly unquenchable thirst for bigger, better, and faster military equipment. For centuries, horses were used for reconnaissance and communications just about anywhere wars were fought. But just after the turn of the century, motorcycles have become the military's vehicle of choice. The problem is, only the best riders can handle the pounding on makeshift and often treacherous battlefield roads. Accidents are just part of the routine. Now, the motorcycle itself is fast, agile, but it takes a lot of time to train a driver. It can flip, it can stall, it can kill its driver. There's no interest in making the motorcycle anything more than it was, a glorified bicycle. For years, the U.S. Army's efforts to develop an alternative to the motorcycle have come up short. As late as 1937, the best they've been able to put into the field is a small two-person vehicle known, for obvious reasons, as the belly flopper. While it can travel at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour and provide a platform for a heavy machine gun with 1,500 rounds of ammo, the belly flopper barely has room for its passengers and is troubled by rough terrain. As anyone who takes a bone-jarring ride in it will tell you, it also has virtually no suspension. And 
and it was light and fast and you know using the terminology of today it was designed to shoot and scoot but it wasn't very capable off-road I imagine you know driving the belly flopper you could probably end up with some broken ribs fairly quickly Although it's not the end of the military's search for a high-speed replacement for the horse, the belly flopper confirms the need for a fast, low-slung patrol car that can move rapidly to the front lines without drawing enemy fire. For years, a small Pennsylvania-based car company called Bantam has been limping along trying to get a toehold in the lucrative military market. But by 1940, the company is producing only a handful of cars. Bantam uh, is not quite dead and is starting to smell dead. Most of the records indicate that they had about, uh, in 1940, had about 15 people working at the factory, mostly just supplying spare parts. And that 15 includes the executives. As the war heats up overseas and the company's future hangs in the balance, Bantam is saved by the arrival of a U.S. Army technical committee at its factory doors. Led by one of the builders of the belly flopper, Major Robert G. Howey, the Army spends time discussing ideas and working up specs for an entirely new kind of four-wheel drive vehicle with the team at Bantam. After working closely with the Army to develop the as yet unbuilt vehicle, Bantam is shocked to find out it's only one of 135 manufacturers invited to bid on the contract to build the prototype. Bantam thought they had the inside track on this job. They did in the sense that they were prepared and in a situation to prepare a bid much quicker than other companies who bid. But Bantam thought that they would get a negotiated contract and not have to bid against others. So they were extremely disappointed when their initial work and discussions with Army led to a bidding situation. Bantam once thought it had the inside track. Now the field threatens to get crowded. Established car manufacturer Willys Overland, once the world's second largest manufacturer, also officially enters the fray. Willys Overland was an interesting company. They weren't in great shape either. Uh, they were certainly in a lot better shape than Bantam was, and, and uh, they had been a very successful company, um, but um, they had fallen on hard times to some degree, and they were just one of the also-rans in the automotive industry. Looking down from on high, the Ford Motor Company, the Goliath of the American industry under the leadership of Henry Ford, shows little initial interest in entering the sweepstakes to build an unproven vehicle. But the Army's concerns over Willys and Bantam's ability to actually turn out any vehicles in large enough numbers inevitably makes Ford a serious player. With a showdown between the U.S. and the Axis powers looking increasingly unavoidable, the American military anxiously calls for bids to be submitted within weeks of sending out the tender. Recognizing its future depends on winning the contract, Bantam recruits a well-known freelance engineer from Detroit named Carl Probst to head up its team. But a late start gives the company just five days to pull its bid together. On July 25, 1940, the day the bid is due, Bantam delivers its blueprints and cost estimates to the military. Yeah, it was, it was down to the wire. They got their bid in, I think, within the last hour or so of it being opened. And they were surprised to see Willis Overland there with another bid. Uh, the government took the two bids, went into the back room, came out half an hour later, and announced that Bantam was the winner. Winning the bid is only the beginning of the road for Bantam. It's now given less than two months to come up with a finished prototype. This is building a completely new vehicle from scratch. There were many bets up in Detroit as to whether or not Bantam could meet this deadline. And most of the bets were that they couldn't. So when Bantam drove the first quarter-ton Jeep through the gates of Camp Holliburg half an hour before the deadline, everybody in the industry was amazed. Bantam's reward for defying the odds and delivering its prototype on deadline is to have it subjected to a motorized version of a living hell. While its rivals continue to perfect their own prototypes, Bantam's pilot vehicle is run through a battery of tests that would destroy any car. Captain Mosley, who was there, he was considered the head torture specialist, and uh, at one point he was seen jumping it off of a four-foot loading dock 
uh, because he wanted to break it. He wanted to break the suspension and break the chassis, and he hadn't been able to up to that point. One of the testers uh, that was there said, uh, when we get a vehicle in here, um, if, uh, if it has anything to confess, it confesses. But even when the ordeal finally ends with a broken chassis after 3,000 punishing miles of off-road driving, the military gives Bantam the green light. 70 more updated versions of its original model are placed on order. In fact, the military's tests on the Bantam prototype showcase a vehicle like nothing seen before, either in peacetime or war. While still a work in progress, one officer calls it the most significant vehicle ever developed for military purposes. Despite its small dimensions and unlikely looks, the little Jeep makes an impression from the moment testing starts. Everything about the vehicle is good. It's not, it, the four, it was four-wheel drive, but that was not a new invention. They had, had four-wheel drive starting in 1913. It just seemed to fit the bill in every, every way, shape, and form. I mean, they could use it for anything. They marvel at its versatility. Why, there wasn't a darn thing the little giant couldn't do. It was designed just right. It was beautiful. Bantam has fended off collapse, but the battle for the contract to mass produce the Jeep has yet to be fought. Only months away from the attack on Pearl Harbor, a revolutionary new vehicle that will help change the course of the war is about to be unleashed on battlefields around the world. prototypes continuing to roll out for road trials through the summer and fall of 1940, it becomes obvious to the military that they're onto something special in the history of motorized transportation. A reliable, swift, and adaptable vehicle that can go almost anywhere. Although it hasn't yet been given the name that will one day make it famous, it's an engineering wonder that's won over even the most cynical observers. It may not be able to compete with the tank for firepower or the fighter plane for speed, but it quickly becomes clear that this is one bit of military hardware that will punch over its weight class. Capable of a top speed of over 60 miles per hour, and with a pulling capacity way beyond anything comparable in its size, the Jeep is the Army's new mighty might. The men testing the prototype at Camp Hollabird feel they already have a winner on their hands. The head of testing there took it out for a spin. He was on the field for about 20 minutes, came back and said he had tested every vehicle the Army had looked at in the past 15 years, and this vehicle was no doubt the best vehicle that the Army had ever received. Being present at that time, uh, Ford and Willys uh, were aware of the success and the promise of the prototype Jeep, and that only uh, fired up their desire to get in the production end of it. With the military already testing Bantam's BRC-60 to rave reviews, Ford brings out its own version of the Jeep called the Pygmy. Willys, not to be outdone, also finally has its own prototype, the Quad with its powerful Go Devil engine, ready for testing. What they ended up doing was giving a contract to each of the three companies for 1,500 vehicles. And the, 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 the great thought behind that was that, okay, each company is going to kind of take a different tack with this. And they're each going to develop things a different way. And then we can, at the end of that, incorporate the best features of each, each of the vehicles into one standardized vehicle. But even though the new vehicle will draw on the strengths of all three prototypes, there is only one winner for the bid to mass produce the Jeep. Willys Overland is the last company left standing, and what started as an unlikely competition to come up with a replacement for the motorcycle dashes the hopes of one company and pushes the other to the forefront of the American automotive industry. All that seals the deal is a cost difference of a few dollars per unit and the military's lack of confidence in Bantam's ability to deliver. Even though the company goes on to produce almost 7,000 models of its version of the Jeep, Bantam ultimately fades into oblivion after losing the bid. 
what appeared to be its finest moment is in fact Bantam's swan song. So with a contract in hand, all Willis has to do is adapt some of their rival's design features into their prototype. They told our chief engineer, Barney Roos, to go back to Toledo and redesign the Jeep. And they wanted certain, vehicle, certain things from each vehicle. From Ford, they wanted the headlights and the grill and the flat hood. From Willis, they wanted the engine. And from Bantam, they wanted the basic body design. So uh, Barney Roos came back to Toledo and came up with this. Ours was, this was our World War II edition. It was called MB, which was military, second issue. No matter what conditions are thrown at the unstoppable Jeep during testing, it meets and exceeds expectations. What made it so good was the, uh, the, the front wheels are so far forward, so if you go up a hill, first thing what you hit was the tires, just the hill, not uh, like on the Volkswagen that had a bit of problem because the nose was a little long, so they stuck their nose first into the ground and then had to climb. This, when you go on a hill, it climbs right up. You could uh, even float them across the river because of the weight. Uh, you have to put a tarp under it and a uh, canvas tarp and fold it on top and, and, and paddle it across the river. In December 1941, the inevitable has arrived as America enters the war. The world's largest industrial power is on full mobilization and Jeep production is in top gear. About 640,000 Jeeps, almost 20% of all wheel vehicles built in the U.S. during the war, will be built over the next four years. More than 350,000 are cranked out by Willys, with several hundred thousand more subcontracted to the Ford Motor Company. It's an all-out war effort that sees traditional rivals working side by side to meet the sudden demand for the Jeep. Hollywood, too, jumps into the war effort, and nothing works better than a movie star swanning around in a spanking new Jeep to generate enthusiasm on the front lines. The new vehicle is suddenly becoming a one-car photo op as it starts popping up everywhere. To this point, the military's new experiment in four-wheel drive has only been known by the model names given to the prototypes developed by the three rival companies. But soon after it's put into general use, the word Jeep that's the name of a comic strip character, as well as military slang for an unproven vehicle, starts circulating. What sort of really started to change things in terms of, of, of the name was when Catherine Hillier wrote a column for uh, one of the Washington newspapers. Willie's had brought some of the Jeeps for a, a senatorial show and tell. They were driving these Jeeps up and down the, the steps of the Capitol, and photographers were there taking pictures. Somebody, some bystander interested in the vehicles asked Willie's test driver, well, what is that thing? And he said, well, it's a Jeep. Now, he had heard all these GIs talking about it as a Jeep, so Catherine Hellyer reported that in her column, and it went all over the country. Whether the new vehicle gets its name through the media, or because it's also known by the military designation for general purpose, or GP, the Jeep very quickly demonstrates its reliability and off-road capabilities on the battlefield. Well, the Jeep enters, uh, enters war, if you will, uh, in, uh, during the invasion of Sicily in 1943, uh, the Willis Jeep, the American Jeep. And, and from then on, it, it, right away, it proves its, its utility by doing virtually every job asked of it. And just being the kind of vehicle that can take a soldier anywhere on the battlefield, because it's unstoppable. It's also unbelievably adaptable, no matter what the need, whether it's serving as a makeshift field kitchen or ministering to the spiritual needs of the frontline soldier, the Jeep just seems to rise to the occasion. And where the little Jeep really shines is as a battlefield ambulance. What took hours or even days before the advent of the Jeep can now be done in minutes. It was an absolute must 
because the Jeep could carry uh, three litters and two wounded. So uh, a small Jeep would take them back to the regimental aid post, which was around battalion headquarters, from the center line, which was where the wounded are taken by the stretcher bearers. And usually the padre was with the Jeep, and then he would send the Jeep back with the wounded. One of the earliest and most spectacular uses of Jeeps in combat comes in 1941 by the British in North Africa. Probably one of the most famous things the British SAS did with it is convert them to fight in the desert. They couldn't stop General Rommel, uh, his tanks, because they, they, they just didn't have enough to stop them. Uh, so they did the next best thing they could. They, the tanks, of course, have to be followed by the gasoline tankers to supply the gas. So the SAS would load the jeeps with machine guns and run behind the rear lines and shoot up the tankers. And that made the, jeep, uh, the trucks or the tanks uh, obviously were worthless without gasoline. So later on in the Pacific, a jeep earns its battle stripes by single-handedly destroying four Japanese tanks. With a 37mm gun mounted on it, the jeep darts in and out of the tanks, firing at point-blank range. Another battered jeep even earns itself a Purple Heart after surviving two successive beach landings. So impressed are the Germans with the new vehicle that they issue a general order that any captured jeep should be used wherever possible to replace their own inferior machines, the Kubelwagen. As the Allies roll up victory after victory in the latter stages of the war, the Jeep is in the thick of virtually every decisive battle. General George C. Marshall, the U.S. Army's Chief of Staff, calls the Jeep America's greatest contribution to modern warfare. It was a sign, you know, when you saw a Jeep, um, unless it had the German cross on it uh, from being captured and used, um, you know, it meant that the Allies were coming and, and the times were probably going to be better for it. Everywhere there are American soldiers or allies using Jeeps, the distinctive nine-slat grill and unique snub-nosed shape of the Jeep is becoming a legend of the Second World War. But as the war comes to a thundering end, not even the unstoppable Jeep is immune from being lost in the hoopla. As the Allies celebrate the triumphant return of their troops, the fate of the Jeeps that carried them from victory to victory is less heroic. Instead of returning to ticker tape parades down Main Street, they are abandoned in large numbers, given away to Allied governments or sold to the highest local bidders. In many cases, Jeeps become target practice or lie forlorn where they're left. It's a sorry end to one of the greatest success stories of the war. Ironically, it's also an ending that comes at the request of the very company that built the Jeeps in the first place. The idea of giving away or selling the surplus vehicles uh, into the market was one that Willys was not real happy with. Right after World War I, they had a lot of excess vehicles, and the way the government got through that was by donating to a lot of local state governments and, and you know, some of these municipalities. But what that did is it, it kind of knocked the legs out from under the truck industry back then. Willie's, you know, it was kind of blatant self-interest on their part, but uh, they really didn't want that to happen. If Americans are going to have Jeeps, argues Willie's, then they're going to have to pay for them themselves. Who are you writing to now, Joe? I'm writing a letter to Willis Overland. Oh. You know, Ed, I'm mighty fond of this little buggy, and so are lots of other guys in this man's army. When I get back to the farm, I'm gonna have one of them. Hey, I'll bet my old man could use one around his mill. Oh, sure he could. Whoever there's pulling or pushing to do, this is the baby can do it. But on a farm, boy, that's where it'll really fit in. Looking to maintain the momentum gained during the boom years of the war, Willie's turns to the huge American farm market to keep harvesting profits. With an army of Jeep-loving GIs returning to the home front, Willie's mounts a full-out marketing assault. It's the mighty Jeep. 
engineered and built by Willis Overland to serve agriculture and industry all over the world in a thousand different ways. In 1944, the first civilian Jeep is unveiled by Willis Overland. It's called the Agra Jeep, and it's designed to tap into the fondness of returning troops for their unstoppable wartime companions. With milkmaids like this, farming in the future should be a very popular science. But G.I. Joes can look forward to even more. Here's an old friend, the Doughty Jeep, back from the wars in civilian garb, ready and able to do 101 new jobs. The company has high hopes that its new Jeeps will be as highly prized at home as they were during combat. The market was there for Willys Overland to pick, and Willys stuck with a utility vehicle, i.e. the Jeep, and, and didn't pursue their plans for a motor vehicle or a car. So there was great demand, and the market was good for the first couple years after World War II with the civilian Jeep. Immediately after the war, they could sell more than they could build. So Willys, as well as a lot of other vehicle manufacturers, loaded up their first vehicles with a lot of accessories to give their dealers a good profit. Outfitting them to work as plows, tractors, and general purpose runabout vehicles for the farm, Willys invests heavily in the civilian Jeep, or CJ. Now boasting a slew of design upgrades, Willys Overland is hoping the newly modified Jeep will become the workhorse of the American farmer, and tens of thousands of CJs are sold in the mid-40s. This is a 1947 Willys Jeep, a CJ2A. It's got some changes made on it that the uh, different from the military, and that is that this is a, what's called a seven slot grill. There's seven slots in here. The military had uh, nine. The windshield was raised approximately three inches, which give it more, uh, more height for the passenger and they raised the seat then about three inches and put more cushion in them. And the reason for that was it would make it more comfortable for the civilian market. The transmission was beefed up and they put a tailgate on the back of the Jeep. It is also a four-wheel drive. Increasing the ratios, it allowed it to uh, pull more for farm use. And uh, they have a small box that uh, that you could put things, sacks of feed or whatever, back here, and you could also use it in the field, and you could also drive it to town on errands. So they were quite versatile, quite handy, and uh, pretty good gas mileage at that, too. But with limited demand for Jeeps in the farm market, Willys also launches a new kind of hybrid vehicle. It was clear that they are going to have to capitalize on the Jeep somehow. So they wanted a backup plan to have more than one or two vehicles. And uh, so that developed into something Jeepy that had the, the, the recognition of a Jeep, but that was more practical for day-to-day -day use. If you like to get away off the beaten track where hunting and fishing are really hunting and fishing, the Jeep utility wagon can get you and your gear exactly where you want to go. Nothing stops the Jeep vehicle. Half car, half truck, the new Jeep is the world's first all-steel station wagon and foreshadows the SUV of a later era. Not just any old family wagon, it's later upgraded to four-wheel drive and a bigger engine. Its legacy is a vehicle that can hit the open trail and still keep the curb appeal of a sedan. Around the same time, the Willys Jeepster, the company's sop to the sports car, arrives on the scene. But its poor visibility, draftiness, and lack of a weather-tight convertible top means just over 20,000 models are put on the road. By 1950, the Jeepster is out of production. The word Jeep on a vehicle means it's versatile, powerful, virtually indestructible. Although it's now known more for its specialty cars than as a major player on the automotive scene, by the early 50s, Willys Overland continues to run on its reputation for rugged, dependable cars. War in Korea guarantees continued demand for military vehicles, and in 1952, Willys' latest military Jeep comes onto the market, incorporating a heavier payload and higher gear ratios. 
For most of the next two decades, up to and including Vietnam, it remains the standard U.S. Army Jeep. But it's an unexpected merger with another car manufacturer in 1953 that really kickstarts the Jeep's long-term prospects. Henry J. Kaiser uh, was a successful industrialist before World War II. During the war, he produced a lot of victory ships, and so he came out of the war with uh, a lot of money. In spite of Kaiser's business savvy, his car company has been a money loser for years. He sees the Jeep line as the savior for his ailing brand. Phone your Jeep dealer for a look at the full line of Jeep four-wheel drive vehicles and an eye-opening demonstration. Look him up tonight. Call him up tomorrow. Under the leadership of Kaiser, the company is willing to take risks, and it looks to grow its core market by trading on the Jeep's macho bloodlines. Guns, dogs, and a Jeep utility wagon. What a perfect combination. The Jeep station wagon took it a long way towards being comfortable, but there was still a long way to go. No need to pamper this baby. Just hose her down. In the late 50s, um, Kaiser Jeep started working on um, uh, a more comfortable four-wheel drive vehicle. And they had some interesting concepts. Its new marquee vehicle has a host of exotic extras like power steering and automatic transmission, giving it bragging rights as the world's first luxury sport utility. Its name, the Jeep Wagoneer. After years of dabbling with farm vehicles, sports cars, and station wagons, Kaiser has developed a vehicle to go after a higher-end demographic, a spruced-up SUV that bridges the gap between the wartime Jeep and a modern road warrior. After World War II, the state of life here in the United States and North America improved to the point where people actually had recreational time. You know, four-wheel drive was perfect for outdoor-type people that wanted to go hunting and fishing and exploring whatever. The little chariot is half duck and half goat. It'll shake off the water and climb back over those boulders without the slightest hesitation. Long forgotten is the Jeep of World War II. The Jeep of the 1960s is more likely to be associated with America's growing preoccupation with leisure time. A new kind of outdoor recreation is taking off, and the Jeep is setting the pace. The GI's best friend has come a long way. Though it's a golden era in U.S. history, America's favorite off-road champion is about to hit a patch of road that may sidetrack it forever. It's the golden age of post-war America, and the Kaiser Jeep is comfortably enshrined in the pantheon of American vehicles. Images of off-road enthusiasts riding high in Jeeps keep them in the public consciousness. But the Jeep's own success has also spawned a growing number of pretenders to the throne. By the late 1960s, the Ford Bronco and the Chevy Blazer are threatening to squeeze the old Jeep off the road altogether. Once the undisputed king of the off-road, the Jeep is starting to show its age. Henry Kaiser, the man who bailed Jeep out of its doldrums back in the 50s, is turning his attention to other investments. Although it's still the gold standard in four-wheel drive, it looks like the venerable Jeep is about to get bounced again. By the late 60s, Kaiser was losing interest in motor vehicle production. Uh, it wasn't going where they had thought it would, and they wanted to get back to their, their other business pursuits. So they ended up selling the Jeep to American Motors Corporation. For years, AMC, under the leadership of Roy Chapin Jr., has had an interest in the Jeep. And in the late 60s, it too looks to hitch its fortunes to the star of the off-road market. Jeep, for example, is an unqualified success worldwide. It has reaffirmed its position as the premier name in the four-wheel drive vehicles. AMC uh, was, was uh, kind of looking for a, a, another outlet in 1970 when they, when they made um, Kaiser an offer he couldn't refuse. Um, and 
it, it worked out good for both Jeep and for AMC. Um, I think AMC was on the beginning of a downhill slump, you know, being sort of the fourth wheel of the big three auto industry. Jeep uh, gave them something that nobody else had. Look at that, a Jeep CJ, hey! The first thing AMC does is go after the youth market. It's the 1970s, and the Jeep's legendary pickup power is given a whole new meaning. Hope you don't mind my dropping in. Come to Jeep country in a Jeep CJ. We wrote the book on four-wheel drive. For veterans of World War II, the new Jeep is only vaguely recognizable. They were a working vehicle for us, but for the yuppie, it could be a toy, and I could see why the young people would enjoy playing with it. The only difference in my case was I didn't have to go out and buy one. They issued me one. Demand for SUVs continues to grow, and AMC Jeep is determined to stay a market leader. If you believe the marketing, everyone has the chance to become a weekend warrior. We'll never make it! Whoa! My Jeep Cherokee can go anywhere. But even with the rebranding of Jeep, sales dropped by 51% in the 1970s. Although SUVs are taking off, the Jeep, the little vehicle that kicked off the whole four-wheel phenomena, is on the verge of collapse. With its corporate future precarious, AMC in 1984 introduces what will prove to be the savior of the brand. It's called the Jeep Cherokee XJ, a combination of the tried and true Jeep qualities of ruggedness and power, and a nod to the growing concern for fuel efficiency. They had gambled the last of their R&D money on that vehicle. It proved to be a big success, and it was a hot seller, and it, it more or less set, uh, set a trend for all the other uh, manufacturers to follow. It sort of became one of the benchmark vehicles of the SUV world where you could have economy, the room that you wanted, and four-wheel drive, and sort of a small station wagon just for everyday pursuit. So it was a pivotal vehicle. Perhaps most importantly, it also gains Jeep the attention of one of America's biggest car manufacturers looking to expand its market share. Chrysler looked at the Jeep brand name and licked its chops. It, it decided it wanted the Jeep, and if it had to buy the whole company to get it, it would. And that's what ended up happening. Chrysler has been a mainstay of the American automotive scene, but recent years have not been so kind to one of the charter members of the Big Three. In the late 70s, Lee Iacocca, the innovative former head of Ford, is recruited to help turn things around. His credo? To solve big problems, you have to be willing to do unpopular things. Well, I think the essential problem that faces the Chrysler Corporation today, uh, the immediate one, is to get itself profitable. I think the success of the Cherokee was part of the reason that, uh, that Chrysler got involved. But I think, you know, when Lee Iacocca took over and, and basically brought Chrysler back from the grave, um, he had his eye on Jeep for a long time because that was a segment, the recreational four-wheel drive thing. He recognized that as, as going to be a market in the future. The Cherokee helps turn Chrysler's fortunes around, and it also blazes a trail its competitors are quick to jump on. But while imitation may be the highest form of flattery, in the end, it comes back to the World War II Jeep that started it all. Well, they came up with a very simple go-anywhere vehicle, and they didn't have a lot of time to think about all the add-ons, so they made it very simple and just plain, plain, plain. But that's what helped the GIs out in the field is it was easy to fix when it broke down. You could get it out of a mud hole with a few guys. You can push it out. It was light. And it was just simple, very simple. And you always could get him home with some spare parts or with just a tape or some wire. You made it home. And that was the most important thing for the GI at that time to get, make it home, make it home somehow. By the 1980s, its connection to the military winds down. After more than 40 years of service overseas, the last Jeeps are phased out by the American Armed Forces in favor of the massive Hummer. But though the wartime vehicle that came to symbolize America is perhaps a fading memory, the Jeep helped recreate the automotive industry and ensured itself a place in history.
From the drawing board to the earliest days of wartime production, the Jeep has gone everywhere and done everything. It's become an icon of American know-how. Through military campaigns around the world and corporate shuffles that threatened its very existence, it's a survivor. And it's one American original whose success is rooted not just in its ability to adapt, but also in its very simplicity. You can trace its DNA right back to the original Jeep. And I, I hope there'll always be some vehicle like that um, in the market to be, uh, to be used by people who want to use them the way that a Jeep was designed to be used. High in the mountains of southern Utah, the living legacy of the original off-road vehicle continues. While the Jeep may have surrendered its role as the GI's best friend, Jeeping has become a passion for hundreds of thousands of Americans. On any given weekend, drivers converge to share the four-wheel drive experience at something called Jeep Jamborees. The Jeep developed until uh, it became uh, a part of everybody's life, at least in the West. After that, the urbanites discovered the usefulness of four-wheel drive and this uh, jamboree program that was to get these people off the road and see how well their vehicles can really perform and get them excited about the prospect of exploring the countryside. Built for the military, today's Jeep has made off-roading a civilian obsession. Uh, Jeep's called Rock Frog. I picked up that name on an obstacle here in Moab called uh, Double Whammy. We climbed up there and got the Jeep hop hopping and it happened to be on film at the time. And, and one of my buddies said, he looks like a frog hopping. And the name stuck. It's totally modified. Everything but the, except the engine. How much do you spend on your vehicle? That's my wife standing near, but it was about 85000 I knew when it went over, it wasn't bad because I didn't hear a loud bang. It was just kind of, it's part of the sport. So just get me back on my feet so we can keep going. What's nice about a Jeep is you can do lots and lots of things with a, with a stock Jeep that you bought off the showroom floor. Or as you've seen here, some of these Jeeps are, are extremely modified and can do more. I'm probably the smallest Jeep here. <laughs> Bring it, bring it, don't get off. Good job. Good job. 60 years ago, the builders of the Jeep answered a call to war that saw the creation of a unique vehicle that blazed its own path on the battlefields of Europe, North Africa, and the Pacific. It's come a long way since earning its stripes in combat, and it may finally have found a permanent home. Since merging with the Daimler Car Company in 1998, Chrysler continues to flourish, and Jeep sales represent a substantial portion of the SUV market. Earlier in my life, all the car companies laughed at Jeep. You didn't build cars, you were a Jeep builder. Who the hell wants a Jeep? So uh, now, every company I think in the world has copied us. The Jeep is unique. It, it's a vehicle that was designed with no style, simply for function, but it performed very well. It had a personality. It, it was a cute vehicle, it was an able vehicle, but most of all, it was a fun vehicle. It, it was a little roadster that could perform off-road as well as on-road. And seeing a Jeep just made people smile. The Jeep perseveres, and it, it probably will persevere throughout time in some form or another. I, I doubt that the name Jeep will ever die. 60 years later, the Jeep's legacy is stronger than ever. But instead of a way of getting to the front lines, today's Jeep is about getting away from it all. Well, it's, it's, it's what's called a Jeep thing. Once you get hooked on a Jeep, uh, seems like you're a Jeep lover forever. 
Born out of necessity, the little Jeep, that most American of motorized creatures, has launched an industry, a way of life, and a mythology all its own. At the dawn of the modern era, even the major military powers are living with old technology. World War I may be called the war to end all wars, but there's a seemingly unquenchable thirst for bigger, better, and faster military equipment. For centuries, horses were used for reconnaissance and communications just about anywhere wars were fought. But just after the turn of the century, motorcycles have become the military's vehicle of choice. The problem is, only the best riders can handle the pounding on makeshift and often treacherous battlefield roads. Accidents are just part of the routine. There was a day when there was no Jeep, or anything even like it. Before the Second World War, the American military relies on a hodgepodge of vehicles to do the dirty work of finding the enemy. But warfare is about to undergo a radical transformation. New challenges call for new solutions, and the Jeep is going to lead the way. It will go anywhere, carry a fairly impressive load. It can be used to communicate, it can be used to deliver, it can be used to fight, it can be used for any job you wish a cross-country vehicle to do. The story of the modest Jeep begins hidden behind the clash of historic forces, but the tire print it leaves in its trail is as deep as it is wide. And while it may be the ugly duckling of the American automotive industry, its impact is felt around the globe. Jeep is a, is a word, you, you, can, you can go into the wilds of Africa and say Jeep and people will know what you're saying. I mean, it's the one thing about America that everybody can agree that they like. Uh, you know, I, I fully expect someday to see a sign that says, Yankee, go home, but leave your Jeeps. desert lands of the American Southwest, a modern-day ritual pitting man against nature is being played out in some of the world's most spectacular terrain. But these weekend warriors who come to the desert in the hundreds have a not-so-secret weapon at their disposal. Squat, ungainly looking, and possessing the tenacity of a bulldog, this is one U.S. born and bred vehicle that won't win any beauty contests. But the allure of the legendary Jeep goes well beyond mere appearances. You name it, the old Jeep has done it. It was sort of the willing horse. Anything you gave it to do, it did it in spades. I guess you'd have to take one out and drive it <clears throat> because this thing is like a billy goat. You can climb mountains with it. The motorcycle itself is fast, agile, but it takes a lot of time to train a driver. It can flip, it can stall, it can kill its driver. There's no interest in making the motorcycle anything more than it was. It's a glorified bicycle. For years, the U.S. Army's efforts to develop an alternative to the motorcycle have come up short. As late as 1937, the best they've been able to put into the field is a small two-person vehicle known, for obvious reasons, as the belly flopper. While it can travel at speeds of up to 30 miles per hour and provide a platform for a heavy machine gun with 1,500 rounds of ammo, the belly flopper barely has room for its passengers and is troubled by rough terrain. As anyone who takes a bone-jarring ride in it will tell you, it also has virtually no suspension. And it was light and fast and, you know, using the terminology of today, it was designed to shoot and scoot. But it wasn't very capable off-road. I imagine 
you know, driving the belly flop, but you could probably end up with some broken ribs fairly quickly. Although it's not the end of the military's search for a high-speed replacement for the horse, the belly flopper confirms the need for a fast, low-slung patrol car that can move rapidly to the front lines without drawing enemy fire. For years, a small Pennsylvania-based car company called Bantam has been limping along trying to get a toehold in the lucrative military market. But by 1940, the company is producing only a handful of cars. Bantam uh, is not quite dead and is starting to smell dead. Most of the records indicate that they had about, uh, in 1940, had about 15 people working at the factory, mostly just supplying spare parts. And that 15 includes the executives. As the war heats up overseas and the company's future hangs in the balance, Bantam is saved by the arrival of a U.S. Army technical committee at its factory doors. Led by one of the builders of the belly flopper, Major Robert G. Howey, the Army spends time discussing ideas and working up specs for an entirely new kind of four-wheel drive vehicle with the team at Bantam. After working closely with the Army to develop the as yet unbuilt vehicle, Bantam is shocked to find out it's only one of 135 manufacturers invited to bid on the contract to build the prototype. Bantam thought they had the inside track on this job. They did in the sense that they were prepared and in a situation to prepare a bid much quicker.